Section 3 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 1 General Principles of Expression. Part 1 the three chief principles stated the first principle serviceable actions become habitual in association with certain states of the mind and are performed whether or not of service in each particular case the force of habit inheritance associated habitual movements in man reflex actions passage of habits into reflex actions associated habitual movements in the lower animals concluding remarks i will begin by giving the three principles which appear to me to account for most of the expressions and gestures involuntarily used by man and the lower animals under the influence of various emotions and sensations i arrived however at these three principles only at the close of my observations they will be discussed in the present and two following chapters in a general manner facts observed both with man and the lower animals will be here made use of but the latter facts are preferable as less likely to deceive us in the fourth and fifth chapters i will describe the special expressions of some of the lower animals and in the succeeding chapters those of man every one will thus be able to judge for himself how far my three principles throw light on the theory of the subject it appears to me that so many expressions are thus explained in a fairly satisfactory manner that probably all will hereafter be found to come under the same or closely analogous heads i need hardly premise that movements or changes in any part of the body as the wagging of a dog's tail the drawing back of a horse's ears the shrugging of a man's shoulders or the dilatation of the capillary vessels of the skin may all equally well serve for expression the three principles are as follows. 1. The principle of serviceable associated habits. Certain complex actions are of direct or indirect service under certain states of the mind, in order to relieve or gratify certain sensations, desires, etc. And whenever the same state of mind is induced, however feebly, there is a tendency through the force of habit and association for the same movements to be performed though they may not then be of the least use. Some actions ordinarily associated through habit with certain states of the mind may be partially repressed through the will, and in such cases the muscles which are least under the separate control of the will are the most liable still to act, causing movements which we recognize as expressive. In certain other cases, the checking of one habitual movement requires other slight movements, and these are likewise expressive. 2. The principle of antithesis. Certain states of the mind lead to certain habitual actions which are of service, as under our first principle. Now when a directly opposite state of mind is induced, there is a strong and involuntary tendency to the performance of movements of a directly opposite nature, though these are of no use, and such movements are in some cases highly expressive. 3. The principle of actions due to the constitution of the nervous system, independently from the first of the will, and independently to a certain extent of habit. When the sensorium is strongly excited, nerve force is generated in excess, and is transmitted in certain definite directions, depending on the connection of the nerve cells, and partly on habit. Or the supply of nerve force may as it appears, be interrupted. Effects are thus produced, which we recognize as expressive. This third principle may, for the sake of brevity, be called that of the direct action of the nervous system. With respect to our first principle, it is notorious how powerful is the force of habit. The most complex and difficult movements can in time be performed without the least effort or consciousness. It is not positively known how it comes that habit is so efficient in facilitating complex movements, but physiologists admit 
quote, that the conducting power of the nervous fibers increases with the frequency of their excitement, end quote. This applies to the nerves of motion and sensation, as well as to those connected with the act of thinking. That some physical change is produced in the nerve cells, or nerves which are habitually used, can hardly be doubted. For otherwise it is impossible to understand how the tendency to certain acquired movements is inherited. That they are inherited we see with horses in certain transmitted paces, such as cantering and ambling, which are not natural to them in the pointing of young pointers and the setting of young setters, in the peculiar manner of flight of certain breeds of the pigeon, etc. We have analogous cases with mankind in the inheritance of tricks or unusual gestures to which we shall presently recur. To those who admit the gradual evolution of species, a most striking instance of the perfection with which the most difficult consensual movements can be transmitted, is afforded by the hummingbird sphinx moth macroglossa for this moth shortly after its emergence from the cocoon as shown by the bloom on its unruffled scales may be seen poised stationary in the air with its long hair-like proboscis uncurled and inserted into the minute orifices of flowers and no one i believe has ever seen this moth learning to perform its difficult task which requires such unerring aim when there exists an inherited or instinctive tendency to the performance of an action or an inherited taste for certain kinds of food some degree of habit in the individual is often or generally requisite we find this in the paces of the horse and to a certain extent in the pointing of dogs although some young dogs point excellently the first time they are taken out, yet they often associate the proper inherited attitude with a wrong odor, and even with eyesight. I have heard it asserted that if a calf is allowed to suck its mother only once, it is much more difficult afterwards to rear it by hand. Caterpillars which have been fed on the leaves of one kind of tree have been known to perish from hunger rather than eat the leaves of another tree, although this afforded them their proper food under a state of nature. And so it is in many other cases. The power of association is admitted by everyone. Mr. Bain remarks that, quote, actions, sensations, and states of feeling occurring together or in close succession tend to grow together or cohere in such a way that when any of them is afterwards presented to the mind, the others are apt to be brought up in idea. End quote. It is so important for our purpose fully to recognize that actions readily become associated with other actions, and with various states of the mind, that I will give a good many instances, in the first place relating to man, and afterwards to the lower animals. Some of the instances are of a very trifling nature but they are as good for our purpose as more important habits. It is known to every one how difficult, or even impossible it is, without repeated trials, to move the limbs in certain opposed directions which have never been practiced. Analogous cases occur with sensations, as in the common experiment of rolling a marble beneath the tips of two crossed fingers, when it feels exactly like two marbles. Every one protects himself when falling to the ground by extending his arms, and as Professor Allison has remarked, few can resist acting thus, when voluntarily falling on a soft bed. A man, when going out of doors, puts on his gloves quite unconsciously, and this may seem an extremely simple operation, but he who has taught a child to put on gloves knows that this is by no means the case. When our minds are much affected, so are the movements of our bodies. But here another principle besides habit, namely the undirected overflow of nerve force, partially comes into play. Norfolk, in speaking of Cardinal Wolsey, says, quote, Some strange commotion is in his brain. He bites his lip and starts, stops on a sudden, looks upon the ground, then lays his finger on his temple straight springs out into fast gait then stops again strikes his breast hard and anon he casts his eye against the moon in most strange postures we have seen him set himself henry the eighth 
Act Three, Scene Two. A vulgar man often scratches his head when perplexed in mind, and I believe that he acts thus from habit, as if he experienced a slightly uncomfortable body sensation, namely the itching of his head, to which he is particularly liable, and which he thus relieves. Another man rubs his eyes when perplexed, or gives a little cough when embarrassed, acting in either case as if he felt a slightly uncomfortable sensation in his eyes or windpipe. From the continued use of the eyes, these organs are especially liable to be acted on through association under various states of the mind, although there is manifestly nothing to be seen. A man, as Gratiolet remarks, who vehemently rejects a proposition, will almost certainly shut his eyes or turn away his face, but if he accepts the proposition, he will nod his head in affirmation and open his eyes widely. The man acts in this latter case as if he clearly saw the thing, and in the former case as if he did not or would not see it. I have noticed that persons in describing a horrid sight often shut their eyes momentarily and firmly, or shake their heads, as if not to see or drive away something disagreeable and I have caught myself when thinking in the dark of a horrible spectacle, closing my eyes firmly, in looking suddenly at any object, or in looking all around, every one raises his eyebrows, so that the eyes may be quickly and widely opened. And Duchenne remarks that a person in trying to remember something often raises his eyebrows as if to see it. A Hindu gentleman made exactly the same remark to Mr. Erskine, in regard to his countrymen. I noticed a young lady earnestly trying to recollect a painter's name, and she first looked to one corner of the ceiling, and then to the opposite corner, arching the one eyebrow on that side, although, of course, there was nothing to be seen there. In most of the foregoing cases we can understand how the associated movements were acquired through habit. But with some individuals, certain strange gestures or tricks have arisen in association with certain states of the mind, owing to wholly inexplicable causes, and are undoubtedly inherited. I have elsewhere given one instance from my own observation of an extraordinary and complex gesture, associated with pleasurable feelings, which was transmitted from a father to his daughter, as well as some other analogous facts. Another curious instance of an odd inherited movement associated with the wish to obtain an object will be given in the course of this volume. There are other actions which are commonly performed under certain circumstances, independently of habit, and which seem to be due to imitation or some sort of sympathy. Thus persons cutting anything with a pair of scissors may be seen to move their jaws simultaneously with the blades of the scissors. Children learning to write often twist about their tongues, as their fingers move, in a ridiculous fashion. When a public singer suddenly becomes a little hoarse, many of those present may be heard, as I have been assured by a gentleman on whom I can rely, to clear their own throats. But here habit probably comes into play, as we clear our own throats under similar circumstances. I have also been told that, at leaping matches, as the performer makes his spring, many of the spectators, generally men and boys, move their feet. But here again, habit probably comes into play, for it is very doubtful whether women would thus act. Reflex Actions Reflex actions, in the strict sense of the term, are due to the excitement of a peripheral nerve, which transmits its influence to certain nerve cells, and these in their turn excite certain muscles or glands into action. And all this may take place without any sensation or consciousness on our part, though often thus accompanied. As many reflex actions are highly expressive, the subject must here be noticed at some little length. We shall also see that some of them graduate into, and can hardly be distinguished from, actions which have arisen through habit. Coughing and sneezing 
are familiar instances of reflex actions with infants the first act of respiration is often a sneeze although this requires the coordinated movement of numerous muscles respiration is partly voluntary but mainly reflex and is performed in the most natural and best manner without the interference of the will a vast number of complex movements are reflex as good an instance as can be given is the often quoted one of a decapitated frog which cannot of course feel and cannot consciously perform any movement yet if a drop of acid be placed on the lower surface of the thigh of a frog in this state it will rub off the drop with the upper surface of the foot of the same leg if this foot be cut off it cannot thus act Quote, after some fruitless efforts therefore it gives up trying in that way seems restless as though says fluger that it was seeking some other way and at last it makes use of the foot of the other leg and succeeds in rubbing off the acid notably we have here not merely contractions of muscles but combined and harmonized contractions in due sequence for a special purpose these are actions that have all the appearance of being guided by intelligence and instigated by will in an animal the recognized organ of whose intelligence and will has been removed end quote. we see the difference between reflex and voluntary movements in very young children not being able to perform as i am informed by sir henry holland certain acts somewhat analogous to those of sneezing and coughing namely in their not being able to blow their noses in other words to compress the nose and blow violently through the passage and in their not being able to clear their throats of phlegm they have to learn to perform these acts yet they are performed by us when a little older almost as easily as reflex actions sneezing and coughing however can be controlled by the will only partially or not at all whilst the clearing the throat and blowing the nose are completely under our command when we are conscious of the presence of an irritating particle in our nostrils or windpipe that is when the same sensory nerve cells are excited as in the case of sneezing and coughing we can voluntarily expel the particle by forcibly driving air through these passages but we cannot do this with nearly the same force rapidity and precision as by a reflex action in this latter case the sensory nerve cells apparently excite the motor nerve cells without any waste of power by first communicating with the cerebral hemispheres the seat of our consciousness and volition in all cases there seems to exist a profound antagonism between the same movements as directed by the will and by a reflex stimulant in the force with which they are performed and in the facility with which they are excited as claude bernard asserts l'influence du cerveau tend donc à entraver les mouvements réflexes et limiter leur force et leur attendu End quote. the conscious wish to perform a reflex action sometimes stops or interrupts its performance though the proper sensory nerves may be stimulated for instance many years ago i laid a small wager with a dozen young men that they would not sneeze if they took snuff although they all declared that they invariably did so accordingly they all took a pinch but from wishing much to succeed not one sneezed though their eyes watered and all without exception had to pay me the wager sir h holland remarks that attention paid to the act of swallowing interferes with the proper movements from which it probably follows at least in part that some persons find it so difficult to swallow a pill another familiar instance of a reflex action is the involuntary closing of the eyelids when the surface of the eye is touched a similar winking movement is caused when a blow is directed towards the face but this is an habitual and not a strictly reflex action as the stimulus is conveyed through the mind 
and not by the excitement of a peripheral nerve. The whole body and head are generally at the same time drawn suddenly backwards. These latter movements, however, can be prevented if the danger does not appear to the imagination imminent. But our reason telling us that there is no danger does not suffice. I may mention a trifling fact, illustrating this point, and which at the time amused me. I put my face close to the thick glass plate in front of a puff adder in the zoological gardens, with the firm determination of not starting back if the snake struck at me. But as soon as the blow was struck, my resolution went for nothing, and I jumped a yard or two backwards with astonishing rapidity. My will and reason were powerless against the imagination of a danger which had never been experienced. The violence of a start seems to depend partly on the vividness of the imagination, and partly on the condition, either habitual or temporary, of the nervous system. He who will attend to the starting of his horse, when tired and fresh, will perceive how perfect is the gradation from a mere glance at some unexpected object, with a momentary doubt whether it is dangerous, to a jump so rapid and violent that the animal probably could not voluntarily whirl round in so rapid a manner. The nervous system of a fresh and highly fed horse sends its order to the motory system so quickly that no time is allowed for him to consider whether or not the danger is real. After one violent start, when he is excited and the blood flows freely through his brain, he is very apt to start again. And so it is, as I have noticed, with young infants. A start from a sudden noise, when the stimulus is conveyed through the auditory nerves, is always accompanied in grown-up persons by the winking of the eyelids. I observed, however, that though my infants started at sudden sounds, when under a fortnight old, they certainly did not always wink their eyes, and I believe never did so. The start of an older infant apparently represents a vague catching hold of something to prevent falling. I shook a pasteboard box close before the eyes of one of my infants, when 114 days old, and it did not in the least wink. But when I put a few comfits into the box, holding it in the same position as before, and rattled them, the child blinked its eyes violently every time, and started a little. It was obviously impossible that a carefully guarded infant could have learnt by experience that a rattling sound near its eyes indicated danger to them. But such experience will have been slowly gained at a later age during a long series of generations. And from what we know of inheritance, there is nothing improbable in the transmission of a habit to the offspring at an earlier age than that at which it was first acquired by the parents. End of section 3